Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, sixth lecture and final lecture on additive uh, manufacturing. So from next week, we'll be discussing another topic. We'll be talking about uh, metal casting. Um, and today, uh, the idea is to look at uh, how can we estimate the costs involved in the production of parts using uh, additive manufacturing. So the lecture is going to be recorded. If you want to switch off your cameras, please do so. Uh, as usual, if you've got any questions, please just raise your hands and we'll try to answer them as we go along or uh, towards the end of uh, the lecture. So um, as usual, uh, just a brief recap of the main points from the previous lecture. Uh, as you remember, We've talked about binder jetting processes and the main um, distinction between the commercially available systems is um, done based on the ejection mechanism um, that we have for the formation of the droplets. So you can either have a continuous stream uh, or you can have uh, and this is probably the most common uh, commercial system uh, used nowadays, the drop on uh, demand. So in one case, you have a jet of material, of binder material that is being ejected from the nozzle as in a continuous stream. And the other one, um, you have the ejection of uh, single droplets directly from uh, the nozzle. With continuous stream, obviously, you, uh, you can have a higher production rate, but the resolution and the accuracy is inferior when compared to the drop on demand. And that's the reason why these drop on demand systems are more common nowadays in commercial inkjet printers. Also, and I would like to clarify this because we've had some, a few questions in terms of uh, continuous stream and how the droplets are formed and directed into the platform using uh, this mechanism. So initially we have the supply of our binder material into the printhead. Once in the printhead and through the action of an actuator, uh, a continuous a stream of material is ejected from uh, the nozzle. After it has the part of the nozzle, then we can perturb this uh, continuous stream and form uh, individual uh, droplets. How can we then direct these droplets into the printing platform? In order to do that, we need to charge these droplets and uh, we can do that using um, a system that is located along uh, the stream or the direction of the stream of uh, the material. Once the droplets are charged, then they go through uh, this high voltage system, and we can then use these deflection plates to direct the particles that are charged into uh, the substrate. The particles that are not charged, then they are catched by this system and can be uh, recycled uh, to be used again in another uh, printing um, operation. So, this is how. Uh, we charge the particles and the level of charge that we use for these single droplets will determine their position on the substrate. And therefore, that will define the geometry of each layer that you are printing. Okay. There are other variations. There, are, there is more into this. So there are different systems that uh, we can use in continuous stream. But what it is important for you to know is the general mechanism that is used to form the droplets and then to direct them into uh, the substrate. Okay, And this is done by charging our particles and using this deflection plate to direct those charged particles into the substrate and form the geometries of, our, um, of, of each of the layers that you are printing. In terms of advantages of these binder jetting processes, obviously the cost is uh, quite attractive when compared to other manufacturing systems because you can use standard components 
from our uh, inkjet printer that we have in our in our houses to build a three-dimensional inkjet printer. The speed can be also um, significantly increased by incorporating multiple nozzles in each of the print heads that we use to dispense the binder material. And we can scale up this process by incorporating multiple printing heads with multiple nozzles. Also, it's one of the few systems that allows you also to print in colors. FDM also does that, but this is a system that is commonly used to create prototypes or parts that have to um, have colors. And as we've said, for some biological applications or medical applications, the porosity that is uh, normally present because of the part of the particles that are used to build the parts uh, can be advantages in uh, some situations, like for example, when we want to create tissue surrogates for um, bone. Also, depending on the materials that we use, uh, it is also possible to create a more sustainable process uh, by using water as a binder. In terms of the limitations, the choice of materials is uh, limited uh, commercially in terms of waxes and photopolymers. We also have limited power accuracy, and this is more in terms of uh, continuous stream because of the way that we use to direct the particles into the substrate. And the mechanical properties, also because of the nature of the, of the materials, uh, it's also uh, limited when compared, for example, with powder bed fusion or with FDM. Because we use the loose powder to support uh, the building of our parts, uh, depending on the geometry of the parts, we can also have issues with trapped material. And in all the cases, we have a post-processing stage that is required to remove the loose powder and also to infiltrate our parts with agents that will reinforce the mechanical properties of our porous um, systems. The other systems uh, that we've looked into uh, is the powder bed fusion. Uh, there are different additive manufacturing techniques that fall under this powder bed fusion uh, classification. And we only talked about uh, selective laser uh, sintering. And in terms of the selective laser sintering mechanisms, there are also uh, some distinctions that need to be made. And one is uh, in terms of the binding mechanism that we use in powder bed fusion. There are four. But the one that you need to know is the liquid phase sintering. And the name of this binding mechanism, mainly the liquid part, has to do with the binder material that we use. And that binder material is normally melted and liquefied when we use the laser to uh, sinter our particles. And that's why it's called liquid phase sintering. There are different types of particles that we can use. Uh, the two the, uh, main uh, classifications is uh, distinct binder and structural materials. So you can use uh, as separate particles. So you can have the binder and the structural material completely separate uh, in the building platform. You can create a composite material. So each particle will incorporate both the structural and the support material, or you can do that by coating the structural material with your binder that, that you will then subsequently uh, melt using uh, the laser. And the other one, uh, more common in terms of polymers, is the use of indistinct binder and structural materials in your building platform, okay? And the reason why we're talking about or focusing on liquid phase sintering is because this mechanism is um, the most uh, common in terms of the commercial systems that are available uh, for the industry. Obviously, because of the nature of uh, the materials, uh, the parts that are normally fabricated using selective laser sintering present uh, very good mechanical properties. Okay, so we can use uh, metals and we can use uh, uh, polymers that display very high mechanical resistance, and this is important in terms of the automotive, but also as the, the aerospace and biomedical industry. 
In the case that uh, we are building parts using polymers, we don't need to create support structures because the loose powder can support the part that you are printing, but that is not the case when you use metals. In that case, you need to create support structures and this is no longer an advantage of the process. Similar to other processes that use uh, the loose powder like binder jetting to support the fabrication of the parts, you can create very complex geometries without the need of creating support structures. And also uh, the range of materials here is much broader than, uh, for example, in SLA or in binder jetting. You can use polymeric materials, you can use metals, and you can also use uh, ceramics to create parts for different uh, applications. As any other, in any other uh, powder-based system, you have the problems of uh, a poor surface finish and, uh, and this normally needs to be uh, ratified in a post-processing uh, stage. Uh, the productivity can be lower compared with other processes and this has mainly to do with the fact that the process of laser sintering needs to be conducted within a chamber and that chamber allows us to control the temperature of the process so that we can minimize the risk of shrinkage. So you need to heat up the chamber before you start printing and then you need to cool it down before you remove the parts from the chamber and do the post-processing. And that obviously will add more time to um, the fabrication of the parts and therefore reduce your uh, production. Uh, also another disadvantage is uh, the energy that is required to sinter or to melt your parts. Um, and obviously this has an impact on the overall cost of the, um, of the parts that you are producing with uh, selective laser sintering. Any questions uh, regarding these, um, these points that we've just covered? Um, what does it mean by induced microporosity? porosity? Sorry, can you please repeat that? Yeah, so what does it mean by induced microporosity? Okay, so the, the microporosity, when, um, when you have these powder particles, um, Obviously, you're going to have, uh, when you bind them, you're always going to have uh, voids between the particles, okay? And that is induced by uh, the fabrication process itself and by the nature of the materials that you are using. Um, and that's, that's why we talk about induced microporosity. This can be beneficial in some applications, like uh, we've said in terms of biomedical applications, but in general, um, for other more industrial applications, you always try, independently of if you use binder jetting or SLA or powder bed fusion, what you try to obtain is 100% solid parts because otherwise the porosity is detrimental to the mechanical properties of your uh, part that you are fabricating, okay? So just please be careful when we talk about advantages in, in using binder jetting to create uh, parts that have uh, microporosity, that is beneficial because of the biological response that we obtain uh, when trying to, for example, create implants for bone regeneration. That's not generally an advantage for other uh, more industrial applications. Thank you. Hi, sir. Hello. Uh, could you please tell again why you do need uh, support material when you are using metals? So as I've said in the previous lecture, um, when you use metals, you have to creates or you have to use very high power lasers to be able to sinter or to melt your um, your metal powders, okay? So you're basically promoting um, the change of state of your material from solid uh, into a melted or molten uh, material. So you eat it up and then you need to cool it down to allow it to solidify. And this transition in terms of temperatures will obviously in, um, imply a change in terms of the structure of your material that will cause uh, the shrinkage of your part. And we try to minimize that by having an environmental chamber where we control the temperature. And because the difference between the temperature within the chamber and the temperature that you are using to melt 
your polymer is reduced, then the effect of the shrinkage is also minimized. All right, but why you why do you need a, a different material uh, from from the one that you have melted? What you mean? We don't, we need a different material from the one we've melted. Uh, as far as I understood, yeah, you have you have said that that we need uh, support material. Then why we are working with metals? Yeah, you need to create support structures, uh, not that you use a different material. Okay. Ah, all right. So, so we use the same material to create the supports. Um, so the, the material that we use to create the supports is the same material that we use to create the parts. Okay. It's different from FDM, where you can have different materials for the supports and materials for the part that you are building. All right. Uh, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Okay. If there are any other questions, I can answer that uh, at the end of the lecture. So I hope you had a chance to look at the asynchronous video that um, I've uploaded on Blackboard. Uh, that is important for you to understand this practical example that I will go through um, during today's lecture regarding uh, the cost model. Uh, however, if you've got questions, uh, please uh, do ask them, okay? So we've said during that asynchronous video that when we try to estimate the costs of parts that are produced with additive manufacturing, independently of the process uh, being SLA or binder jetting or FDM or part of adfusion, the major uh, variable in terms of the cost of the parts that you are producing is the time required to build those parts. So that is a major variable and that has the bigger impact in terms of um, the cost of the, the parts that you're building or the total batch that you are uh, producing. So uh, in today's example, I would like you to, uh, to take you through this, um, uh, this, um, this question where basically you're asked to calculate the total build time associated with the manufacturing of a hearing HL using a VAT photopolymerization, in this case, sterile lithography, uh, within a VAT or a building platform uh, with 650, 350, and uh, 300 millimeter um, in terms of the dimensions. So the first thing that you need to understand, and that's why uh, it is important that you understand how each, each system operates, is that in the case of SLA, we will need uh, support structures. And for that, we also need to incorporate in our total uh, build time, the time that we need to record uh, the material that we use for the part, but also the time that we need to recode the material for the support structures, okay? And this is different because when you're calculating the build time, for example, for FDM, you don't have to account for this recode time because there is no recode, okay? The use of support structures is um, associated with the deposition using uh, extrusion printheads. There is no re recode mechanism to uh, deposit the, the material onto the building platform. So this is the part or the machine information that is given to you. So the bounding box, or uh, in other words, the, this virtual box that encapsulates each one of your parts as the dimensions of 15 uh, by 12 by 20 millimeters. So this is X, Y, and Z direction. The total volume is a thousand uh, cubic millimeters. The thickness of each layer of your parts is 0.05 uh, millimeters. The difference, uh, the layer thickness for the support structures that you are printing to support fabrication of your parts is 0.1 uh, millimeters. The total height of your support structures is 10 millimeters. And you will have gaps both in the X and Y directions between the bounding boxes of four millimeters. And normally these gaps are used to prevent uh, that the, the, the bounding boxes are attached. The total scan or deposition length 
So the total length that your print set or your laser in this case will um, have is 349,290 millimeters. You will do this at an average scan speed of 6.230 millimeters per second. And the time to recoat a layer of the part is the same as the time that is uh, re required to recoat a support structure and is equal uh, to six uh, seconds. So if um, a similar question appears in the exam or in any other assessment that you have, normally this is the information that you are provided with, okay? So we, we give you normally the average scan speed. It can be calculated, but we normally give you this because this depends on um, the system that we use. Uh, we also provide you with the scan deposition length or the total length uh, that your print set will have. Um, and normally the general dimensions of your parts are also uh, provided to you. So knowing this information, the first thing that we need to calculate is how many parts can actually fit into our building platform. And as I've said in the, the asynchronous video, we need to consider this as a two-dimensional problem. So we need to be able to determine how many parts will fit in our building platform in the X direction and how many parts can fit, can fit into our building platform in the Y uh, direction. For the moment, we are ignoring uh, the Z direction and we are assuming that we're not printing a part one on top of the other. So we only print in the X, Y plane. In order to do that, we, we can use this, uh, this formula that gives us a total number of parts. The first part of this equation gives you the number of, of parts that fit into the X direction. And the second part of the equation gives you the number of parts that will fit in the Y direction. If we consider that the dimensions in the X direction are 650 millimeters, and this is given to us. And if the dimensions, the total dimensions of the platform in the Y direction is 350 millimeters, the bounding box, each bounding box that encapsulates the part that you are building have the dimensions of 50, 15 millimeters in X and 12 millimeters in the Y direction. And if we have four millimeters in both directions between these bounding boxes, then we can compute this into the formula and obtain the total number of parts. An important thing, when you are calculating the number of parts that fit into the X direction, you will see that with these numbers, you will obtain 33.36 uh, parts. Obviously, you need to have entire parts, okay? You cannot have 33.5 uh, or half parts. It needs to be always entire parts. So you always need to round down this number at this stage, okay? So in this case, what you have is 33 parts in the X direction, and you will have 20 parts in the Y direction. You, have, you always have to have entire parts in each of these uh, directions. And if you multiply uh, 33 parts by 20 parts, you'll obtain a total of 660 parts in the two dimensional platform. So this is the number of parts they can fit into the building platform at uh, once. So now that we know the number of parts that we can fit into the building platform, we need to calculate how much time it will take to scan those parts. And for that, we know the number of parts, the scanning length is given to us. So this is a total scanning length to build those 660 parts. And we also know uh, the speed or the average speed at which the laser will travel to print those parts. So considering the scanning length as 349,290 millimeters, 
at an average scanning speed of 6,230 millimeters per second. The number of paths uh, being 660, as we've calculated in the previous slide. If we compute this into the formula, what we obtain is 10.28 hours. So this is the total scanning time to build those 660 parts. This 3,600 is only used to convert from seconds to hours, okay? So normally you have this in hours and not in seconds. So in terms of the build time, the other components that will also uh, influence the, the total time that you'll have to build your parts is the recode time. So the time that you need to either recode the building platform with uh, support material or with building material. And to calculate that, we need to know the number of layers of the support structure, multiply that, that by the time that is required to recode each one of those support structures, and the same for um, the part that you are building. So you need to know the number of layers of the parts and the time required to recode each one of those parts. So if you consider that the number of layers of the support structures, we know the total height of the support structures. If we divide the total height that is given to us by the layer thickness, we can obtain the total number of uh, layers for the support structures. The same can be done for the number of layers of the parts, but in this case, instead of using the total heights, we use the dimensions of the bounding box in the zeta direction. And then we divide that by the layer thickness, thus obtaining the number of layers for um, the part that, were, that we are building. And we also know, because that is given to us, that the time to recode the part is exactly the same as the time to recode the support structures and it's equal to six seconds. This can be different, okay? But in this case, they are uh, the same. By knowing this, we just have to compute these numbers into the formula and obtain the total uh, recode time um, for uh, the parts that we are building in uh, the building platform. And that is uh, 0.83 uh, hours. Obviously, as in, in any um, editing manufacturing system, we also need to account for the different uh, delays that we can have in the process. And in order to account for those delays, we need to know the pre-delay time. So times or delays that are associated with, for example, setting up um, the, the print heads um, in order to, to actually calibrate uh, the system. So these are all pre-delay times. So all the times before the printed head is actually depositing material, or in this case, the laser actually scanning um, your uh, VATs and the post-delay times. And sometimes, like for example, in the case of part of that fusion, you can also have additional times like the time required to start the process. So for example, if you need to account for the time to heat up and cool down your uh, environmental chamber. This is normally accounted by uh, this component here in this formula. So if you consider that the number of layers of the part is 400, uh, we know that the pre-delay time is given to us and it's 15 seconds. The post-delay time is 10 seconds. And the time to actually start the printing process is 0.5 hours. You can compute this into the formula and obtain a total uh, delay time of 3.27 uh, hours. Now that you know the time required to scan your parts, the time required to recode, and all the delays associated with the building of your parts, you can calculate the total uh, build time. And if we consider that the scan deposition time is 10. 28 hours, the recode in total for those 660 parts is 0.83 hours, and the delay time being 3.27 hours, the total build time for these 660 parts is 14.38 hours. Now that you know the build time, 
um, and as you've probably seen in the asynchronous videos, using this build time, we can then calculate um, the total cost of our build. Um, that or this build time will have an impact in terms of the purchase price of the machine that is allocated to this specific batch um, and also on the operation costs for this specific uh, batch. Obviously, the total cost of the batch will also account with uh, materials and uh, you can uh, easily determine that using the information that is provided on the, um, on the asynchronous videos. Uh, this is not going to be the only example that we're going to cover in terms of um, um, the cost model for additive manufacturing. And during the tutorials, we're going to give you other examples of uh, different questions that we can ask and uh, the different ways that we can use the cost model to estimate um, not just the building times, but all the costs associated with the production of parts using additive manufacturing. Okay, so this is all I had for uh, today's lecture, and I'm happy to take any questions you have uh, now.